Okay, so thank you. So hi everyone. So this is uh, joint work, uh, yeah, with Peter Gaggi and Krzysztof Pietrzak. We are both from IST Austria, and as you can see from the title, the talk is going to be both about kid sponges and truncated CBC. But actually, so that's what the paper talks about. But the talk is going to be mostly about kid sponges, and hopefully, I can convince you on the way that the truncated CBC case is just a special case of the result. Okay, so broadly, this talk is going to be once again about pseudorandom function. And uh, in particular, pseudorandom so functions are central concepts in symmetric cryptography and well beyond that. And they are used for numerous applications. They're used as message authentication codes. They're used for symmetric encryption. They're used for key derivation and so on. And in this talk, I'm going to focus concretely on those hash functions that are obtained by appropriately keying hash function by inserting a secret key somewhere into the computation of the hash function roughly so that what we get is a good pseudorandom function. And of course we know this and the well known construction, the, the most widely used construction doing this is HMAC uh, which is used all over the place. But somehow HMAC is actually some extra overhead that we would not like to have in it which is due to the fact that the HMAC construction needs to deal with uh, potential extension attacks on the underlying hash function, namely the fact that uh, for all hash functions up to before SHA-3 uh, that I've been using in practice, it is easy, given H of M, to compute the hash of an extension of M even without knowing M. Okay? And this had to be taken into account because it's a property that we don't want to have in a good PRF. But for SHA-3, actually, uh, there are no extension attacks by design. Okay. And so HMAC is not really necessary, okay? And in particular, SHA-3 relies on the sponge construction, which uh, in its basic form relies on two parameters, really, N and R, as I'm going to use it today in this talk. And uh, there's a third parameter, C, which is just a shorthand for N minus R. And to hash a message M, the sponge construction relies on some underlying fixed permutation, pi, which goes from N bits to N bits. And it starts by splitting the message into R-bit blocks. And then the computation starts with some initial state with, uh, we can, with an M-bit state. And we can think of it as having an upper R-bit part and a lower C-bit part. And then at each round, we are going to XOR the message block into the upper part of the state and then feed the whole state into the permutation and get the next state. And we do this over and over again and until we are done, we run out of message blocks. And then to find the final output, in order to prevent extension attacks, what we do is we take the final state and we truncate it by chopping off the lower C bits. And then we just left with the upper R bits, which are our hash. Okay? So to be fair, the sponge construction achieved much more. Also variable output length, for example. But I'm not going to talk about it in this talk. Okay. So. If we want to get a PRF from it, this is a hash function, there are two natural approaches to key sponges. One of them is by putting the secret key into the initial state, into the IV. And the other one is by prepending the key to the actual message. Okay? So the second one is actually more desirable in practice because you don't have to modify the underlying hash function to get what you want. And if you like HMAC or you are in the HMAC wars, you can think of this as moral analogs of NMAC and HMAC in the sponges world. So, and in this paper, what we do is we address the question of how secure these constructions are as pseudorandom functions. And we are not the first ones doing so, but our contribution is to give the first near tight analysis of the concrete PRF security of these constructions. And we do so both in the random permutation model and we also give analysis in the standard model. And we consider both keyed IV and uh, key prepending variants of uh, keyed sponges. Okay? And it's clear that, I mean, we believe these results have direct implications, of course, on SHA 3. So Chatri uses sponges, and our results give a strong validation for deriving PRFs and MACs from sponges. And also, they validate ad hoc construction that are based on the sponge paradigms, but perhaps not on Chatri. Okay. And this talk is going to be mostly focusing on the random permutation model analysis for the key IV case, which gives most of the uh, important ideas behind this. So when I talk about PRF security in the random permutation model, what I mean is that I think of the key sponge construction now explicitly as an algorithm that takes inputs, produces outputs depending on some secret key K, and also makes explicit black box queries to some underlying permutation pi, which for the proof we are going to model as random. 
So it's chosen uniformly at random from the set of all n bit permutations. And our attack model then considers a distinguisher that can make both construction queries to the sponge construction as well as primitive queries to the permutation pi and to its inverse. Okay, so the distinguisher is required to output a decision bit and we assume that a distinguisher here to be computationally unbounded, so it can compute as much as it wants, but it's bounded in the number of construction and primitive queries it's allowed to make. Okay, and to achieve security, we would like this real world to behave close to an ideal world where this sponge construction is replaced by a truly random function, okay? And we measure the concrete security of the construction by looking at the advantage, the PRF advantage of such a distinguisher, which is the difference between the probabilities that the distinguisher outputs one on the left and the probability that it outputs one on the right. Now, random permutation model security proofs, of course, do not give us an actual security proof. So the real permutation underlying sponges is not random, but they nevertheless give us some strong security uh, guarantee in terms of proving lack of generic attacks, for example, that that treat the underlying uh, permutation as a black box, okay? And just that, just understanding the concrete security for generic attack against kid sponges, it's already something which is really not resolved today, okay? In fact, the best attacks that we know to distinguish uh, kid sponges from a random function are, so achieve advantages of the following form, either something like Q square over two to the C, where Q is the number of construction query, or if you allow primitive queries, then you can achieve something like Q times Q pi over two to the C, okay? But the bottom line in all of these attacks rely on the ability to find collisions on the lower part of the state, on the lower C bits. And in particular, not any internal state collision, like for example here, but we are really interested in finding collisions on the lower C bits for states that lead to an output. So for example, if you output the outer part, you know that, and you find a collision in the lower part, then you're, it's actually easy to distinguish the construction from a random function. And it's pretty much all we know how to do, okay? But still there's a gap with, you know, what provable security guarantees to us. And in particular, an interesting question that you might ask starts from the observation that all of these attacks, they can, only be, they can all be cast as only relying on short messages, like messages that are only a few blocks. And for example, you might start wondering things because we wondered about them for other constructions of PRFs and Macs, whether we can find attacks that you know, exploit message lag. Perhaps you only need to make a few queries because you're only allowed to do that, but you use long messages and that help you distinguish. And in fact, if you look at the related work uh, that I mentioned before, there's been numerous analysis of key sponges, starting from the first indifferentiability proof for sponges that implies already something in this context. But all of these analyses actually leave this possibility open that there may be such attacks exploiting length. In fact, all of these analyses, analyses prove a bound on the best advantage achieved by a distinguisher that can make Q construction queries of length at most L and give us bounds that have pretty much uh, the form that I gave there, which strongly depend on the length. So here the length means the number of arbit blocks that your message consists of. Okay, so all bounds have this following form, and in particular, they include terms that, for example, have the form L squared times Q squared over two to the C. So it might well be possible to find an attack which makes very few queries, but uses a high L. But we don't know any such attacks, and so one can conjecture that maybe this lack dependence is not necessary. So what's our main result? So our main result is a new bound on uh, the PRF security of sponges, which is very close to what we want to have. So the first two terms are actually exactly what we will expect. But uh, there's an additional part of the bound that actually depends on the length. But the key point is that the part of the bound that depends on the length only has terms with denominator two to the n, as opposed to two to the c. And this is actually not too bad in general, because remember that c is equal n minus r, and uh, for example, in many concrete applications, like when we use uh, SHA-3, uh, R is pretty large, and it is very safe to assume that L is strictly smaller than two to the R. And in those cases, this final term just goes away, and the bound is really matched by the attacks, and it's tight. Now, note that our result applies to a more general construction that actually doesn't restrict the message blocks to be R bits, but they can be arbitrary N bit blocks. And uh, they might have some structure, 
but they do not need to be arbit. They can be arbitrary ambit blocks, and the only constraint is that at the end of the construction, you just chop off and truncate and get only the first arbits. And the interesting point here is that if you now think of the permutation pi as being secret and not public, then this is exactly the truncated CBC construction. Okay? So if you think of your distinguisher as not making queries to the permutation pi, you can think of pi as coming from a block cipher and then you get directly an analysis for truncated CBC. And in fact, for the remainder of this talk, to give you an intuition of the proof, I'm going to restrict myself to this truncated CBC scenario and I'm going to just discuss how the proof works in the case where the distinguisher can only make Q construction queries but not primitive queries. Does this capture already most of the challenges of the proof? Now, so in particular, what are these challenges? So if we want to prove security of this construction, we have to take into account two things that make the proof difficult. The first one is that we have to deal with dependencies that are not available when analyzing other constructions, say like encrypted CBC, for example, or prefix-free CBC. So we can make a query, learn an output, and then make a later query such that the computation of the output for this later query, query depends internally on the output of the previous query. And this is because we can just go on computing and we're just outputting part of the state as one of the outputs. And another issue is, of course, that all of the previous analysis get non-tight bounds because what they do is that they essentially, their bound comes from essentially bounding away the possibility of having collisions in the lower C bits of the state at all. But not all of these collisions are good. Some of them we don't know how to use them uh, for attack. So we have to find another way around that to analyze the construction. So and our approach is based on the idea that we model the computation of the sponge construction, of the kit sponge construction, on a sequence of inputs as a labeled tree, which we call the vertex tree, which is a bit different than usual graph theoretic in interpretations of when analyzing iterated uh, symmetric constructions. In particular, the message tree is going to have the vertex set consisting of all of the prefixes of the messages we are considering. So we are looking at the computation of the kit sponge construction on a set of Q messages. So the set of vertices is going to consist of all of the prefixes of these messages. So for example, if we have four messages here consisting of different blocks here, here by a bold face zero, 01, I mean a block consisting of n times that bit, you know, we will get something like this, where the violet uh, vertices correspond to the messages and the orange uh, vertices correspond to prefixes of it which are not messages that we are actually looking at. And then we can model the computation of the sponge construction here by assigning label to vertices that correspond to the internal state, state values of the construction when evaluating it on these inputs. So for example, we're gonna start assigning to the root a label corresponding to the secret key, and then we just go on applying labels that by just evaluating what the construction will do. So for example, the label of one is going to be obtained by applying the permutation to the label of the root XOR with the message block leading you there. Okay, and so on. We can assign labels to all of the three and the labels of the violet vertices are going to be exactly the outputs of the Keats sponge construction on the corresponding inputs. And it's also convenient, just to give you an idea of the framework in which the proof is placed, to define a reduce message tree, which is exactly the same thing, except that we are going to hide from you those labels that are assigned to the actual inputs, which are the actual, so those that are used to compute the outputs of the construction. Of course, the outputs are going to be obtained by truncating these labels. Okay? So why is this good? Because in the actual proof, what we are going to do is we are going to consider transcripts of interactions of the distinguisher with the given construction, and we are going to enhance them by appending this reduced uh, message tree to them. For example, in the real world, we are going to consider an interaction of the distinguisher with the sponge construction, making queries to the underlying permutation, and this defines a sequence of input messages and corresponding outputs, and this finds a transcript, and we are going to additionally add to the transcript the corresponding reduced message tree. And we are going to do the same in the ideal world. Here the outputs are random, but we can still define, after the execution is over, a reduced message tree by using a random and independent permutation. Okay? Now, of course, 
uh, this can only help the distinguisher. And in particular, what we can show easily is that the advantage of the distinguisher D in distinguishing these two worlds is not larger than the statistical distance between these two augmented transcripts. Now, of course, we are giving a lot more information to the distinguisher, and the question is how much does it help? But the intuition is that this reduced message tree should not help too much because we are deleting exactly those values from it that lead to outputs of the kid sponge construction. And so this should not, it should not help you distinguishing the real world from the ideal world. The catch is, of course, that this nice intuition is not true, like always. So such reduced message trees can actually give you some information. You know, for example, even if I erase all of the values that define the outputs of the key sponge construction, you might still learn interesting things in some isolated cases. So, for example, if I give you such a tree, and then I tell you that additionally, the label of zero, which is up here on the left, and the label of one, one collide, you can see that. I haven't erased them from the tree. You can also infer, because I'm using a permutation, that the corresponding inputs collide, and in particular that the label of one is equal to the label of epsilon XOR with the one block. And this is useful because now it's going to allow you to learn what the output value is on this message and allows you to distinguish the real world from the ideal world. And so we have to exclude some degenerated message tree. And in particular, these are exactly, I mean, this is a long definition, but it's easier said in words. These are exactly those reduced message tree where, to, so if you look at the message tree, these are exactly those where the values assigned to the messages and the values assigned to the successor of the messages, which was exactly what we exploited here, are not unique and collide with something else that you can see. Okay? So if something like this happens, when we reduce the tree, we're just going to say, sorry, bad luck. Uh, the, reduced the, so the tree is going to be set to some error message, which I, uh, error symbol, which I did not hear a star. Okay? And otherwise, you see everything as before. And in particular, we're going to say that an interaction transcript is good if the corresponding reduced message tree is not going to be reduced to such a star. Okay. Okay. So, and the expectation now, which is still not easy to see, is that if we give such a non-degenerate reduced message tree, now it's going to be hard to distinguish. Okay. And this is something that we are going to prove by, yet again, like in many other talks in this conference, by using uh, Paterne's H coefficient method, which is, is going through many new applications. And in particular, the idea here is that we have this set of possible transcripts, we have a set of good transcripts, which are those for which the underlying message tree is not degenerate. And now, if we manage to show the following, okay, which is the essence of Paterne's H coefficient method, that there exist some values, epsilon and delta, such that the probability that in the ideal world a transcript is not good, so it's outside this blue set, is at most epsilon, and moreover, all good transcripts appear with more or less the same probability in the real and the ideal world. So they are related by some multiplicative factor, one minus delta. Then the statistical distance between the transcripts, the real and the ideal ones, is at most epsilon plus delta. Okay? It's a very useful lemma. It has nothing to do with cryptography. It's just a very nice property of the statistical distance, but it turns out being really powerful. And in fact, it's not hard in our context if we define uh, bad good and bad transcripts as we just did to bound the probability that an ideal transcript is not good in the, uh, by using actually a very powerful lemma by Bellare, Piacek, and uh, Rogaway from Crypto 5 that was addressing CBC-like construction but applies to this setting. So the hard part is actually the second part of the proof, namely proving that the probability of getting a good transcript in the real world and in the ideal world are close to each other and they are related by a factor of one minus delta where delta is exactly pretty much what we want, something like Q squared over two to the C. Okay? And I don't have time to say much more, but I just want to say that the key problem here that we want to address is the following. So imagine that you're given a real world transcript with a reduced message tree, which you know that is not from the degenerate case. So the underlying message tree was not degenerate, so the corresponding labels were unique. Then the question that we are asking is now, given this reduced message tree, for which you don't know some of uh, the labels, uh, the underlying problem is essentially a counting problem. You want to know how many ways do you have to, f to complete this reduced message tree into a full message tree without making it degenerate, and such that these new labels that you are completing with are consistent with the actual outputs of the construction. So this is 
an just inherently accounting problem, which is the core of the proof, okay? And uh, I've been cheating a little bit here by hiding some higher order terms and the fact that you have to still make some assumption that the other labels that you see are well behaved, but everything pretty much work out in sort of a painful way. Okay, so just to conclude two final things about other results. I mentioned in passing that we also have standard model bounds. Not much to say here except that we, so essentially we can fit our result in a very elegant framework that came up in a workshop paper a couple of years ago by Chang et al. that was giving standard model security proofs for sponge-like PRF constructions. And we can fit our improved bound in their framework, which essentially reduces, so this will be our improved bound, but it essentially reduces the standard model PRF security of kid sponges to the PRP security of the underlying permutation when placed into some even mansoor like ciphers where instead of whitening the whole input and output as you usually do in even mansoor you're just going to whiten the lower c bits of uh, the inputs and the output okay so this is still expected to give you some sort of good cipher and if you assume that that's really secure and you have a bound on how close this is to a random permutation then you can use this bound to plug it in in the standard model result and it's going to give you a standard model bound Okay, the reason why this doesn't uh, supersede our random permutation model result is that when you translate this result to the random permutation model, which is the usual benchmark model for sponge-like construction analysis, uh, the bound that you get are actually weaker than the, one we can, the ones we can prove directly. Okay, but it's still interesting. And also there was a recent work by Andre et al at the last FSC that actually showed how you can make this reduction tighter by instead of having this factor Q times L, you can have another quantity which is called the multiplicity, which in some applications it's smaller and it's easier to bound. Okay. And uh, the other thing that I haven't mentioned and I don't have time for is uh, the key prepending case. Uh, so in particular in the paper we give a full analysis in the random permutation model again. There's not really a standard model analysis there for the case where we prepend the key to the message, and in particular, and this is really the harder case, the key can be spread across multiple blocks, okay? So this makes the analysis significantly harder, and in particular, to do that, we actually surprisingly have to find a connection with work in the area of key alternating ciphers and recent analysis by Chang and Steinberger uh, to actually similar problems come up when analyzing this key absorption phase uh, before, when. The, when the key is placed before the message, okay? And again, the non-trivial part is dealing with the fact that you might have collisions in the lower uh, C bits of the state, but that's not the end of the world. So we have to get around that. And, uh, and so we can't just simply exclude those collisions because this is not gonna give us a good bound. And also in passing, I want to notice that in this concurrent work I just mentioned by Andre et al, there was also a claim in the previous, in the first version of the paper that was claiming a better bound than what we have here, but ended up actually having a mistake which is now fixed by using uh, the techniques that we have here. So if you see a better bound around than ours, it's just not because, uh, so that the, the bound has been correct. Okay, so this is pretty much all I can say uh, in the time of this talk. Um, so I think the, the, the bottom line here is that uh, given the fact that SHA-3 now is our new reality and it's going to be used and we want to build PRS from hash function, then understanding the concrete security of the resulting constructions is really, really important. And it turns out to give rise to quite of an interesting technical problem that we have addressed here if you want to give bounds that are really tight and match existing attacks. Okay, and I think we really had to develop some new techniques and new ways to look at how you analyze such iterated PRF construction that I really hope that have been, can be up applied to other constructions. And in terms of open problems, so I cheated you a bit during this talk. I have to be honest about that. So if you haven't paid close attention to the bound and haven't talked, maybe, but the bound was a bit, uh, at, you know, was a bit simplified. There are some higher order terms in it, if you look at the paper, which are not relevant for the statements I made, but make the bound that look a little bit uglier than it should be. And it's not clear whether they're necessary or whether they're the result of our proof technique. So cleaning up the bound in that sense is definitely a meaningful open problem that might lead us to learning new things. And also, uh, so the tightness of the bound assumes again that messages are not, they can be very long, but they cannot be longer than two to the R, where R is the output length. So investigating tightness outside this regime is also a very interesting open problem. And uh, we have a full version of the paper online, so with all of the proofs, and that's all I wanted to say. <laughs>